Now, let's shift things and start exploring the amenity benefits from city living. Some urban amenities, like nightlife and museums, are prone to become more attractive as city size increases. These are also sometimes called agglomeration economies, but they are agglomeration economies in consumption rather than production. A lot of people makes it easier to share the fixed costs involved in theaters or museums. Urban scale allows specialization in restaurants and consumer services. You can find dozens of nail salons within a few blocks on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and many leafy suburbs lack even one. The flow of ideas in cities might also enable more creativity in cooking or in the arts. We could model this by assuming that everyone is identical and all receive the same wage, which is fixed and independent of city size. The flow of amenities, however, might increase with city size, reflecting greater specialization and sharing of fixed costs. We would then get an upward sloping demand for city space just like before. But the other possibility, which I refer to as the demons of density, is that urban amenities get worse when city population increases. The most obvious of these downsides of density is traffic congestion. As city population rises, so does commute time because streets become more crowded. The more standard economics word for this type of thing is negative externality. An externality occurs when one person's action impacts another person in a way that is not mediated by the market. So if I make your life better by cleaning your house, that isn't an externality because you presumably pay me for that service. If I make your life better by shoveling the snow on the street in front of my house and you enjoy the snow-free walk, then I am generating a positive externality. When I drive, I create congestion that slows down everyone else. That is a negative externality, and when an activity generates negative externalities, then in equilibrium there will be too much of that activity going on, like too much driving. A second negative urban externality is contagious disease. When there are more people around you, then you have a better chance of catching a disease and spreading it to someone else. How do we handle this graphically? Well, assume again that wages are flat, and that urban quality of life is declining with the number of people in the city. Add those two curves together, and you get th that the demand for city life is declining with the size of the city. Better governments are better able to deal with these downsides of density. Singapore, for example, manages to deal with traffic congestion through electronic road pricing. So we can draw two lines for quality of life, both the same when population is low, but one line, reflecting the better governed city, falls less than the other as city population increases. Add these to the same fixed wage and we get two demand curves, one in which demand falls slowly with city population and the other in which demand falls quickly. We add in a supply of space in the city and we see the impact of good government on city prices and city size. The better governed city has the higher demand curve. It strikes the supply curve further out so that population is higher and prices are higher too. As city government improves, the city expands and its prices rise.